This is while crafting the art of foraging on this world and beyond. And I believe in the description of it, they were talking about um, trying to figure out what plants are edible and what, uh, how to determine what is edible and how to find, safely find and forage for wild foods. Um, wild crafting as a term is a relatively new term. So I, when I was a girl, I started to learn um, about wild crafting from my grandmother who taught me how to find things that I could eat. And it started out with huckleberries because we were in the Pacific Northwest. And it morphed into beach combing, so gathering things like gooseneck barnacles and making soup out of them. Um, and I should pause at this point before I just plunge right into explaining too much more about the wild crafting itself. I should say I'm Cedar Sanderson. I am um, an author. I have seven novels in print, and the eighth one I just finished writing should be out before too much longer. Um, I have a number of short stories. I don't know how many off the top of my head. <laughs> I write um, articles for my own website, which is Cedar Writes. Um, and I also write for a group blog for writers, which is by writers for writers, called Mad Genius Club. Um, as my day job, I am a scientist. It's literally my job title. Um, the realistic version of that is I work in a quality control lab. Um, I work at a plant. We make um, a drug. We make one drug. We do it very well. We don't kill people. That's my job as a quality control scientist, is to make sure that there, um, everything that is supposed to be in the drug is in the drug, and nothing that's not supposed to be in the drug, which actually includes uh, microbes and parts of microbial contamination, um, is not there. So we test, we test extensively. Um, and that, so that's my day job as a scientist, and that actually forms what, um, how I approach wild crafting and gathering wild edible foods. Because wild crafting is not just about edible foods, it's often frequently paired with gathering wild medicinals. As a scientist, as a, and especially as a quality control um, professional, I find more and more as time goes by that I have a little bit of trouble with the concept that a lot of people seem to have, which is that you can gather wild medicines and use them to treat or even cure um, your whatever illnesses it is, because you are often taking an unknown substance into your body at an unknown dose, it's very risky. I no longer teach um, gathering med medical plants or fungus because I believe that it is a risky practice. Um, it's not something that I actively discourage, and I will certainly help um, good people ask me for authoritative sources, and there are a lot of sources out there that are not authoritative, which I'll get to in a minute when we come to edibles. But um, when you are growing a plant that has medical properties, the amount of the active ingredient, um, the, the actual chemical that you want to do what you want it to do, can vary according to was it a rainy season when it grew, was it a dry season when it grew. So you, you can take in the same dosage, so say you're, you're making a tincture or a tea, um, and you can drink the same amount or, can, or eat it or something, and you might not be getting the same amount of active ingredient. It's dangerous. Um, but that's just to sidetrack why I won't be touching on um, medical and, and herbalism um, in this particular thing or, or any time I'm teaching on gathering wild edibles because it's um, something that should be approached with great caution. And there are certainly ways to use natural medicines that are reasonably safe. Unfortunately, human nature is, and I'm sure you've all had an experience with this, if a little bit of something is good, then a lot of it's better. Yeah, not always. <laughs> the dose makes the poison. And that brings me to something I wanted to start this out with. Somebody had said mushroom earlier, and the leading quote for this, this should probably be Terry Pratchett's line of, all mushrooms are edible once. <laughs> 
So, and that's the thing with determining what is edible. In this world, determining what is edible is a lot easier. When you get out into a strange world, if we're doing deposit, being on another planet, say we have a crash-landed spaceship, you're stranded, you've got to figure out what you can eat, and that's a whole different scenario than uh, me coming here to Utah never having foraged here going, what can I find to eat? Um, because it's it's fraught with, I had this conversation with friends earlier who talked about this panel, I was saying, I don't know anything about Utah wild edibles. And they said, well, when the Mormon settlers came here, they lived on the Sago Lily. But none of you should go out and dig up a Sago Lily and, and test out how tasty the tuber is because they're a protected plant, they're a state um, flower. And that's the case in many states where something like, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of an endangered, I'd probably say Indian cucumber in New England um, is there are times when you might be going along and I have actually eaten Indian cucumber before I found out that it's um, an endangered species. Um, because I lived in a particular spot where in our woods we had thick mats of it. And it's this cool little plant. It's got a whorl of, of um, leaves arranged all, all the way around the stem and then these neat little lily flowers on top. And the root at the bottom kind of crooks and go at a 90 degree angle and it does taste a lot like a cucumber. Well, where I lived, we had a lot of them, but in most of the rest of the region, they were very rare and hard to find. So when you're going to be going out and wildcrafting in this world, um, it's best to be familiar before you um, say, oh, I know what that is, I can eat it. Um, you need to be familiar with the whether or not that plant is, is a common um, uh, invasive species or fair game eat them, um, please. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you want to know what you are gathering, um, and you want to know it really well, which is the benefit, uh, obviously, of wild crafting on this planet. We have a lot of resources that we can go to to find out, even before you leave the house, you can be familiar with what grows in your region that you can safely harvest and eat. Um, the, the one common plant that I can think of that I'm sure you guys have here in Utah, and we have pretty much everywhere else in the U.S., is dandelions. Mm -hmm. So and dandelions are very edible in a lot of different ways, and they're common enough that they're easy to um, harvest. However, how many of you know that there are look-alike species to dandelions? You do, and you do. That's, that's two out of the things, which is pretty good, actually. So there are a number of wild lettuces that look like dandelions. Chicory looks a lot like dandelion. Um, there are some other things as well. So being very familiar with um, not just the overall look of it's a rosette of leaves, and they look like a dandelion leaf, but oh, those leaves are a little furry. That's not a dandelion. Dandelions aren't furry in their leaves, but chicory is hairy. Um, and I don't know if you have chicory here. It's a common roadside weed, but I think it needs more moisture than you're going to get here. So if you're ever driving more Midwest or Easterly, um, and even I remember it from Oregon too, and you see a pretty powder blue flower all along the side of the roadsides, that's probably chicory. Um, and the root is famous for being a coffee substitute. It tastes nothing yeah. like coffee. <laughs> but when people are desperate, things that they will eat, and that gets into wild crafting as well, is you can be gathering plants because um, you are hungry and you will eat anything, but those same plants when you're not so hungry aren't going to taste good. Most of us are not going to be doing this under survival conditions. So while I'm try, trying to think of some good examples of things that are really kind of nasty. Um, there's a couple of plants that you can gather and you have to boil the leaves and then drain that water off and throw it away and then boil them again and drain that water off and throw it away and at that point you might be it might be safe to eat the plant because you have essentially cooked out the toxin that meant that it would be make you very sick to eat it raw however what you have left in the pot is a green gelatinous mess that you are going to have to choke down because it's nauseating and that's a survival food, and they're 
certainly instances of settlers in this area, and if we go back to our stranded spaceship crew, they might have to eat something like that because they need something in their stomach. But most of us are not going to be in a situation where we need it. So there's a difference between being edible and being tasty edible. So um, speaking directly to Utah, it's going to be a little bit more difficult than it would be if you have a landscape that has more water. And that's going to make a big difference. Um, mushrooms, the fruiting body mushrooms, you're going to find in places that are very wet. Um, so while there may be species of mushrooms that you might find in Utah, you're probably only going to find them for a fleeting time after a rainfall. Um, or in a specific wetter season, and you won't find them at any other time of the year. Uh, a good example of this is uh, chanterelles, which, again, I'm speaking very broadly here. I've wildcrafted in Alaska, Oregon, New England, and Ohio. So much wetter climates, especially because my time in Oregon was Pacific Rainforest, which is where I learned how to identify chanterelles. Chanterelles in the Pacific Rainforest you can find and harvest year-round. We actually pick them commercially and sold them to restaurants. Um, so, but in New England, chanterelles have a very short um, window of maybe a month where you could find them because it was either too dry or got too cold and they froze. So there's a lot of different factors when you are going to be going out and gathering and being prepared to, and knowing what you're looking for before you go and being knowing, understanding the seasons, like if you're morel hunting, uh, they're pretty much only a spring thing. It's a pretty limited window and they're hard to find because they look a lot like the dried leaves that they tend to be going in. Um, so as far as resources go for for this world, because we obviously can't talk about resources for San Centauri, um, but there, there are a couple of ways to do this. There are some excellent books um, on wild edible plants. I always recommend that you look at more than one source before you assume the edibility of the plant. There are some things that are very safe, like dandelions. Um, cattails are very safe and edible. There are things that there's some argument over whether or not they're edible. There are things like dock, which is a Rumex crispata. Um, it's a very common weed in wet areas. I don't know about here in Utah. Um, it is, it's mucilaginous, which is a fancy word for it's slimy. <laughs> and if you cook it, it doesn't, it, it's slimy. <laughs> but um, the thing about dock is while it's edible, and when it's young and the leaves are still kind of curled up to itself, um, it's actually quite crisp and can be good that way. If you eat too much dock, it's very high in vitamin A. And vitamin A is accumulates in the fat like vitamin D does. Vitamin C, most of the vitamins we're familiar with taking as supplements, um, it passes right through the system. Something, and a vitamin that accumulates in the fat does not. So you can actually poison yourself if you eat too much dock. They're um, getting more into the, the hunting end of things. If the uh, liver of the polar bear is extremely high in vitamin A, and if you eat even part of it, it can poison you. Um, one of those random things of, I definitely don't recommend that you go out hunt and eat polar bear. But for one thing, bear, especially bear that's been eating a lot of fish, tastes bad, really bad. Um, anytime you try to eat a predator, it's probably going to taste bad, but when you get hungry, you do desperate things. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts to things that you can eat, but they might not be good for you long term, and they might be good for you in excess. So if you're gathering something and you like it, you don't want to eat too much of it, um, and you don't want to be eating it like every single day. <coughs> the, uh, one of the stories that comes from the early pioneer times of the United States from the colonists is uh, from Jamestown, they were gathering and eating what we now call Jimson weed, 
in Jimson is a contraction of Jamestown. Jimson weed um, is a detrural species and it's highly toxic. It causes hallucinations, it causes delusions. They didn't realize this, it didn't make them immediately sick when they were eating it. It wasn't until people started going crazy that the people put two and two together and realized that it was the Jimson weed that was actually poisoning them because they didn't have a lot else to eat, they weren't cultivating foods yet, so they were trying to gather <coughs> edibles. When I was a kid and trying to teach myself some of this, I read my dad's um, Air Force survival manual and the section that they covered on um, how to determine if something was edible included taking a little bit of it into your mouth and chewing it and if it made your mouth burn to spit it out. Mm -hmm. There are still people that teach that as a method for identifying poisons. I have seen this especially in mushroom forums as a method to taste the mushrooms. Do not do that. <laughs> there are mushrooms that will kill you by just having done that. There are mushrooms that will poison you by just having touched them because they do have toxins that can pass through the skin barrier. Um, there are obviously plants that will poison you by touching them. I think we all know what poison ivy and poison oak will do to you. So I, I, I always say that if you're not as sure of the plant's edibility, don't put it in your mouth. Um, and it's best to find out from authoritative sources. And I just mentioned mushroom forums. I belong to, I think, three different mushroom forums on Facebook and a couple of wild edible plant forums. And um, there's at least one subreddit called What's That Plant that specifically says when it identifies things that you, they will not identify for edible. Because there are a lot of people on the internet that know a lot of things and most of them are wrong. <laughs> so I actually will, I, I hang out in these forums and I'll occasionally chip in and say, hey, that's this common name with this scientific name. Because common names vary a lot. Mm -hmm. One of the ways I bonded with my mother-in-law when we first met, before she was my mother-in-law, was we walked through her garden together. And now mind you, I'm kind of a Yankee girl. I spent 20 years in New England and I grew up in Alaska. So I'm getting together with this southern Kentucky lady who has the most wonderful accent. And we're talking about common names of plants and we're totally like not even the same thing, but we both recognize that plant. We know what it is. We just call it different names. She has this tall, lovely lily with these gorgeous pink flowers. And I looked at it and I went, oh, naked ladies. And she said, that's a resurrection lily. <laughs> <laughs> so I now get to grow those in my garden. I never lived any place warm enough before, and they're amazing. The reason they're called resurrection lilies, or naked ladies is what I call them, because it tickles me, um, is the leaves come up in the spring, and then they die back. And in July, surprise, you have flowers. Mm. And if you don't remember that they're there, you'll mow over them. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you rely on online sources for plant identification, um, the first thing you're going to want to do is to take the best possible photos of the plant. I can't tell you how many blurry pictures of leaves people have sent me and said, hey, see, what is this? Can you take another picture of it? I actually had a friend online um, had taken a very backlit, very artistic photo and had posted it and said, does anyone know what this is? And I looked at it and I said, it might be this, but can you take another mm. photo of it that isn't backlit? And she did, and it was what I thought it was. It was a red maple blossom. Um, but it, most people snap a shot and then move on and can't go back and do it again. So the a trick is to hold your cell phone, because most people, that's what you're going to be shooting with. I have my DSLR in my bag, but most of my photos are with my cell phone. So hold it as steady as you can. Try to get as close as you can, um, but also a shot that includes the entire plant is good because what you're shooting is not just the plant with um, leaf placements, you're also um, shooting the surrounding ecology. So someone that's looking at it can tell, is this in a dry area, is it in a wet area, is it in the woods, in the shade, because things grow in different places and it depends on where it is, sometimes you can tell what it is. 
And if you post one of these in one of these helpful handy dandy forums, you will probably get tons and tons of comments and they will be all different answers. So then what I suggest is to take the answers that you have been given and do your own research. Use it as a springboard. So don't trust what people are telling you. Go out and verify it. There are some excellent books. Um, Paul Stamets is a great resource for mushrooms. He goes off into the weeds about <clears throat> recreational uses of mushrooms, but for identification. Um, Elio Schechter's book, In the Company of Mushrooms, is excellent, and he brings a very interesting analytical scientific eye to fungus um, that I really enjoy. As far as wild edible plants, I usually recommend that you try to find something that's a local or regional guide. Um, say, for instance, in the Midwest, up around the Great Lakes, I would say Samuel Thayer is hands down the best. Um, he does something most wild edible food guides do not. He actually gathers and prepares and will give you like recipes, tell you what it tasted like. A lot of food, wild edible food guides are just like, this is edible, this part is, is edible, and this part is edible, and um, don't eat this part. But they don't talk about flavor, and they don't talk about uses. Um, I, I know I get teased for this, and I don't understand it, but I think it's because I grew up without TV, so I never saw the ads. But my hero was Ewell Gibbons. And he's really the one that took, uh, I took off with his books and was very disappointed because when I first found them, I was in Oregon and then moved into Alaska after Dad was out of the Air Force. And, uh, <laughs> None of the plants that he gathered grew up there, <laughs> which was very disappointing to looking for them, not being able to find them. Um, but he's excellent as, as far as describing how he prepared things and, and what it tasted like. Um, and they're kind of dated at this point because he's been dead for probably 40 years. But um, things like that are good things to find, and it's going to depend on your region how available they are. Here in Utah, I'm going to guess it may be slightly difficult because this is a very dry area. You're not going to have the diversity of species. Um, and the idea of trying to live off the land here daunts me. Um, I would imagine that if I had to, I would probably do have to do it primarily by hunting um, because I don't know enough about the ability of the plants to venture a guess as to how much you could gather and what could be gathered and then preserved for later. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time because I do want to open this up to questions very shortly. Let's see here. I wanted to say that as far as, as ascertaining edibility, if you were, say, stranded on another planet, I've seen some excellent takes on this in stories, and unfortunately, I was racking my brain to try and remember. There's at least one that I've seen where they, the story dealt with the fact that the humans on this planet could eat the plants, but they lacked um, certain vital nutrients because we do have micronutrients that we have to take in from our diet. And so they were trying to figure out how to supplement in that. And that would be a really interesting thing where you can eat it, but it wouldn't kill you, but it's lacking something, and so you find yourself getting sick and not understanding why. Um, figuring out when something is edible when you're in a totally alien surrounding, that doesn't necessarily mean on another planet, um, is a little bit of trial and error because you will occasionally see text saying, well, if an animal has been eating it, then you can eat it too. To which I would like to say, how many of you know not to feed your dog chocolate? Mm -hmm. The dog can't eat chocolate, you can eat chocolate. It's the same way, other way around. Mice can eat things. I've seen mice nibbling on mushrooms that I know for a fact would have killed me if I put them on that. And dying by mushroom poison is not fun. The amanitas kill you by slow organ death, and there is no way to reverse the effects. Um, it's a particularly nasty way to die. Uh, rhubarb. Hey, anyone in here actually like rhubarb? I believe. Yay! <laughs> Other rhubarb lovers. So rhubarb is always one of those things of how the heck did they figure out that was edible? Because the leaf is poison, and it's particularly nasty poison, because oxalic acid makes your mouth swell up, and then it makes your throat swell up, and you can't breathe anymore. And well, 
But the roots are poisonous, the leaves are poisonous, but the stem is fine and can be delicious, stewed up with some sugar or maybe in a pot. Um, but how did we figure that out? <laughs> I'm still trying to answer that question. Right as well. But so that's the thing is, is that you can't really go by. Okay, the animals have been eating this, so therefore I can too. And there are things that we really enjoy that are toxic to other things like um, theobromin, the chocolate ingredient. Capsaicin is a natural pesticide that plants produce to keep things from eating them. And we go, that's tasty peppers, and, and sprinkle it on our french fries. Um, <laughs> so solanin, which is um, the toxin that's present in tomatoes and peppers, and it's not present in enough quantities to make us sick most of the time, but it is why when your potato goes green, they say you should at least peel it, if not discard it, because it's probably higher in solar. And then there, the science on that is a little shaky as they get more research into how much of it's actually there. So I'm going to ask for questions at this point, because I feel like this is a huge topic. I'm trying to compress it massively, and I'm curious to know what specific things are right. So you mentioned uh, uh, several ways to not test food. What's the way to test food? Uh, in my opinion, the way to test food is to do your research first. But I realize that if you're if you're truly in a survival situation, um, really at that point you are going to put stuff in your mouth. Um, and. I would say that if it were me, I would be cooking it first because um, there's a lot of things that are destroyed by heat um, and you don't know beforehand um, what can and can't be killed by heat. There's aflatoxins, there's a bunch of different things that if you heat it up, that breaks down and it's perfectly fine to eat after that. Um, as far as, like, say, berries, let's go with an easy one. There are a couple of rules of thumb that foragers use for berries. Um, in general, if it's a blue berry, it's probably fine. If it's a red berry, proceed with caution. If it's a white berry, do not touch it. Um, almost all of the white berries, and there's not a lot of them, but there's things like snow berries and such, um, are toxic. Um, that, however, breaks down because there's a really pretty little woodland of lily um, called Claytonia, um, and it's also sometimes called bird's eye because it's got these little blueberries with a, a indent in the center so they look like an eye. Um, they're highly toxic. Children have been killed through eating just one or two of them, um, a much larger dose for a, an adult. So, but they're not properly a berry, they're actually a fruiting body of the lily. And then we get into the bot botanical weeds I've been trying to avoid because, uh, well, knowing botany is important, most people don't. Um, so, I mean, I personally say if you're going to learn how to identify, learn how to use a dichotomous key. Um, which is, a, it, it basically rules things out as you go along, and it's one of those things that is very easy to narrow down into something specific, but it also teaches you to catch things like the dandelion leaves I was talking about earlier. Dandelion leaves are smooth. If they're fuzzy, they're not dandelion leaves. If they've got prickles on the midrib underneath the leaf, they're probably a wild lettuce. South, south thistle is a common one. Now, south thistle is also edible. It's very bitter. You really don't. I mean, dandelions can be bitter, don't get me wrong. South thistle is always bitter, horribly bitter. So you can eat it when you don't want to. <laughs> so any other question? Yes. Uh, what about skin testing? You talked about putting some in your mouth. To figure yes. Out. Uh, skin testing is more <clears throat> of a, am I going to be allergic to this? And it would be a good way to rule out plants that have a contact toxin like poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac. Nettles are a quick and easy one if you brush up against a nettle. But nettle is edible because you could rub it on your skin and go, okay, that's bad. That, I'm not putting that in my mouth. But if you cook nettle, it's perfectly fine. And there are people that do a, a, a pureed nettle soup with a little wood sorrel in there for tanginess. And, oh, it's so good. So yes, skin testing is helpful. And it's certainly good to learn what you personally might be sensitive to. Um, because different people are going to be sensitive to different plants. There are plants that I have to be careful with in my garden. 
I have uh, vitiligo. I don't have pigment in part of my skin. So I'm very photosensitive. If I rub up against a plant that enhances photosensitivity, and there are some, it makes my life miserable and I get to pretend to be a vampire for more than my normal. <laughs> so skin testing is a, is a useful tool, um, but like mouth testing, it has its limitations. I think probably the big takeaway from this is we proceed with caution. So anybody else have a question? Yes. You said to use a dichotomous key. A dichotomous key. How do you spell that? D I C H O T O M O U S. Sorry, one more time. Dichotomous D I C H O. Now I've. O T O M O T O M O U S. Sorry, I switched my N's and my T's, and I'm like, Ugh. thank you. So. Where can you find those? Um. I would talk to your local college and your botany professors, and they could probably point you at a local one. Dichotomous keys can get huge fast. So going with a regional one, um, when I took field botany, we were working with a three-state woody plants only, not even getting into wildflowers and such. Um, and it was, uh, we, we carried ours around loose leaf in a one-inch binder. Um, if you're using them in the field, I actually recommend this because you can pop them in the plastic sheet protectors upside down, so the opening is on the bottom, and then if you're using it and it starts to rain, your pages are probably not going to get horribly ruined. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to... Uh, learning how to sketch is actually a, a really valuable skill, and, and so here's the thing, I am an artist. <laughs> I am an artist because I have spent years practicing to be an artist. I don't have any great talent or skill, but the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. And there are some really great resources out there that will help you do basics of botanical illustration. But if you learn how to sketch, you'll be able to capture more with sketches of the plant and of the angles than sometimes you can with photographs because you're eliminating all the extraneous details of that way. That's all good. They just tip. Yes. So, what are some of the things you like to grow in your garden? I, I am, I am a very lazy gardener. So, I grow a lot of native plants because if they're native to my area, they're probably happy there, and they're going to require less care for me to grow. I also, um, I like to photograph and sketch bugs, and if you're natives, you're going to attract some really interesting insects. Um, so I grow a lot of perennials. Um, I'm also, I was raised as a permaculturist, before permies were cool. <laughs> um, so I practice zone gardening. So the things that I'm going to harvest the most are the closest to the house. Mm. The things that require the most care are the closest to the house, because otherwise, we're humans, we're lazy. We're not going to walk out 100 yards to our vegetable garden to tend to it every day. But if your basil is right two steps out the back door, you're going to keep it clipped because if you let it go flower, you'll lose your leaves. <laughs> um, and you'll harvest from it more often. So uh, those are the things that I kind of incorporate into planting my gardens. I also do a lot of lasagna gardening mm -hmm. because I'm such a lazy gardener, I don't even want to dig. So I, I will lay down cardboard or some other kind of organic material that's going to break down and mulch on top of it and then I'll plant through that. Um, we just bought a house last summer in April, it's been almost a year, and that was the first thing I did was when I got all my moving boxes, I had this stack of cardboard and I laid out my garden, put all the moving boxes down, bought several yards of mulch, had them bring that in and then I put that down and I started planting through it. Um, so I will do a lot of edible landscaping and I'll choose plants that are both um, pretty and I try to choose plants that are going to be pretty over multiple seasons. So I'm looking for things that have some flowering interest, um, that might have fruits or berries in the summer, pretty foliage in the winter, um, and then maybe if I can, I mean this is a true perfect plant, some winter interest in either colorful twigs or um, foliage that remains on the thing or seed pods that remain on the thing. A lot of people like to deadhead immediately. Seed pods are cool. If you ever spend some time looking at all the shapes and structure of seed pods, they're really nifty. So I like to leave those on and 
the seeds in them are food for birds and attract them. So my gardening philosophy is basically low maintenance but big bang for my life. Anybody else quick question? We're not quite sure how much longer we have. A while, don't we? Okay, excellent. Um, delving in more to the alien worlds and wildcrafting on the alien worlds, the so I grew up, and this is, wildcrafting tends to be associated with um, plants mostly. So going out and finding a sessile thing, basically. It's not going anywhere, it's just saying that you're free to find it. But I also grew up hunting, fat, fishing, and trapping. Because we often lived very, very rarely. When we lived in Alaska, we were subsistence hunters. We had to have meat to get through the winter. Um, that's the case for a lot of people. We lived out in the bush of Alaska, which is the interior. Um, we did not live so far out of town that we didn't have access to a grocery store. But at the time, in the lower 48, milk might be a dollar a gallon. It was five dollars a gallon in our store. We kept goats, we kept chickens, we raised as much as we could for food. Um, we took a trip to Fairbanks once every four months and stocked up on perishable stuff and stuff that we could get. So if I were stranded in an alien environment, my first thing would be to do is to figure out if the local wildlife was up. Um, because that's a more efficient way to get your calories than green things are. And you're ideally, if you're in a survival situation, what you really, really need is fat and lots of it. Um, in America, we've had a demonized fat, cut the calories, don't eat as much fat. But if you're in a survival situation, you are burning all of your energy and you need all the sugars, all the fats, all that horrible stuff you've been told that you should need because we're sedentary. But in a survival situation, you're total opposite. And most wild animals don't carry a lot of fat on them, which is why people tend to go for the other sessile target um, and they gather eggs. And gathering eggs is not something we're going to recommend on this world because it is, we have eliminated entire species because humans by gathering the eggs as we can get to them. Um, and they're easy and obviously then the animals can't reproduce if you've gathered their eggs. So other than like keeping chickens or keeping something and then keeping their eggs but also keeping enough aside to reproduce and raise another generation, um, wild gathering of eggs isn't something I would advocate except if you're talking about that survival situation where you're on another planet and you figure out that their eggs are tasty and how um, then as far as writing it into the story, it's probably a great way to get more fats because that's essentially what a yolk is. It's got all kinds of nice fats and nutrients because it's meant to support a developing chick and it will support somebody that needs to eat it. And there, the other thing too is that if you kind of hark back to prehistory and the hunter-gatherers, they weren't necessarily hunting large animals. So deer and elk and mammoths and um, mastodons. Uh, that's a cool idea, but most of their proteins probably came from little small scampering things. And uh, insects are one of the, the last remaining food taboos, although it's slowly been eroding. I can buy cricket flour in a local store for $40 a pound, which is why I have not. Uh, <laughs> I want to experiment, but not that much. <laughs> so, but it, it's super high in protein and um, insects, grubs. I mean, I, I think if you ever watch like shows on eating, I'm thinking of Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmer, and I used to love that show. But there's a few cases where he's eating grubs because it's what the local people do. But there, I mean, that's a lot of fat in there. There's a lot going on in that as far as package of what am I going to do to survive? Sometimes you eat things that you wouldn't necessarily think to eat otherwise. And sometimes you accept that things might make you sick temporarily um, if you're in a situation where you are going to be rescued. Um, the thing I was talking about before, the Jimson meat, where it was slowly making them sick. Slightly different thing. Um, I spent a lot of time in what's called 40-mile country in Alaska, 
And during the gold rush into Alaska, it was an area that a lot of miners came up into that area. It wasn't a big mining place, so you'd have like one guy go out there and he'd spend the summer mining and then he'd come back in and detox because the water in that area is full of arsenic. Mm -hmm. And arsenic won't kill you in a low enough dose, but it does accumulate in the body as, as, as do some, some other heavy metals. You can live with it, it'll make you sick, but you can eventually get it out of the body um, later on. And so that's one instance that I can think of off the top of my head where these guys, they might not have needed to put themselves in this survival situation, but they were slowly getting ill, and I think some of them, from what I recall, they actually did know that it, the water was not good, but they also knew it wasn't going to immediately kill them. So they'd put up with it, and then they'd go back to town and spend winter in town drinking way too much. Uh, <laughs> so that's actually, okay, throw that in there real quick. Um, I have some experience in extreme cold weather survival training. And in extreme cold, um, foraging is probably going to be right out. Um, most of the animals are holed up. Um, if you can find something that's hibernating, but there's, the plants are not going to be an option for you with that thing. However, things like trying to eat snow is a good way to get dead um, because it lowers your body temperature. Um, Any time you're out and in the environment for, well, if it's raining and 55 degrees or colder, it's only a couple of hours. I've been hypothermic within two hours under those conditions. Um, I've been hypothermic multiple times. It's not fun. I don't recommend it. I do, however, know what it feels like. Um, I've, okay, I, get that back. I have been to the euphoric stage where you get beyond feeling cold, your body relaxes, you actually start to feel warm. I've not been to the stage where I started taking off clothes, but there are a lot of important cases where that was the case. Of they, their bodies were shutting down and because all, all their circulation was pulled back into their core. They actually felt too warm, and so they started to take clothes off. Of course, I just kills them fast. But the uh, the prospectors in Alaska found something out the hard way, which is that alcohol, when it freezes, water freezes out of it, but you still have liquid. Liquid at 30 below zero, if you drink it, will stop your heart instantly. Mm. Oh. There's a few cases of guys killing themselves because well, the booze was still there. But alcohol under cold situations is also a bad idea, and even if it's not that cold, it's not going to kill you. It um, dilates your external blood vessels, which is just what you don't want, so you're losing heat faster when you consume alcohol. It makes you feel warm, but it's a false sensation. So, I've wandered off while crafting into just general survival. So, yes. So, most animals on this planet are edible, I assume, if you cook them. If you're on a, no, I'm, I'm being general, so you yeah. can say no. Uh, <laughs> on another planet, what would be a sign maybe we could put in where this is an animal that we should not eat? Is it just color? Well, color's a good one. I think we're all familiar with the concept of tree frogs. They're brilliantly colored being a stay away sign. And that probably would work well because if you, if the ecology and evolution is similar to what we experience here on this planet, then bright colors are generally a warning sign. Um, so the other thing that I would say, and this goes back to talking about the polar bear liver, is if it's a predator, it's probably not good to eat, um, just because they tend to have different uh, different proteins and their, their flavor is going to be different, but it's, it's just it's not pleasant. It's, it's more, that's more of a taste thing than a necessarily edible thing. And there are also um, various animals that have glands or venom sacs, and that's something you'd want to look for. Um, you can safely eat, say, a skunk, if I have one. Um, because in theory, if you're able to kill it without it spraying, and then you're able to clean it without breaking the scent glands, it should be perfectly edible, but it's one of those things that it's a messy process. And even deer, um, which are very commonly hunted and eaten, 
have scent glands that you have to be very careful while you're butchering because you'll spoil the meat. Mm. Um, and butchering is a, a skill that oh, not a lot of people have anymore. I'm not going to wander too far off into these weeds except to say that I've been doing it since I was six. But my kids, on the other hand, even though they grew up on a, a farm, didn't get involved in it and would have no idea what to do as far as making sure that they didn't say puncture the gut, which will spoil the meat. Um, and so that's something that you have to learn with an with a alien animal is maybe its guts aren't where you expect its guts to be. Maybe there's venom sacs that aren't where you would expect them to be. Uh, the platypus has venom on its elbows. It, it, you don't expect to find a venom on an elbow. Only the males do. <laughs> yes. Um, but so it's one of those things of if you're going to write an alien animal and alien physiology, one of the most fun ways to do this is actually to build off birth things. Look at marine biology. Mm. There's freaky things swimming out there in the ocean. <laughs> so I think uh, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, mm. Dave Freer's Rats, Bats, and Vats. His aliens and that are based on sea urchins. They evert their stomachs, they throw them up basically, and engulf their prey and dissolve them and then consume them. It's not something you expect to see. <laughs> It's not pretty, <laughs> but it was kind of one of those cool things of I'm reading his alien description and I'm like, oh my gosh, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very different and I think we have time for one last quick question and then probably I was given the five minute warning quite a while ago, so. It's, it's quarter two. Yeah, yeah. Time, so. Thank you guys. I'm like, yes. So you said like grubs and insects and stuff. Would you want to cook those ever or do you want to just eat those to get more nutrients out of them? People can do both. Um, and I would say that there are certain things that do need to be cooked because they might have poisonous spines on them. Never pick up a fuzzy caterpillar. Um, tarantulas are quite edible, but you want to torch off the spines first because their hairs are irritating. So I think that that's kind of a guide there. If it's fuzzy or hairy, you probably want to cook it or somehow get the hairs off because they're probably there for a reason. Um, and that's actually true for some plants as well, that like nettles, the, the hairs on it are what have the source of the irritation. Um, so. There's ways to, if you quickly burn that off and then it's fine, I wouldn't eat a fuzzy caterpillar either. Um, just, there, are, there, are, there are fuzzy caterpillars that look really cool, but they will leave you in pain for days. Also jellyfish. <laughs> so, thank you so much.